I am uh, switching gears today, starting a new series, and uh, I don't know how long it's going to go or where it's going to go, but we're going to talk about worship. And um, I want to read to you out of the book of Acts chapter 30, and um, excuse me, Acts chapter 20, verse 35. And Paul is talking on his uh, ends of his missionary journeys, and he's talking about gifts that have been given for the ministry in every way. And he says this, he says, I have showed you all things how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. And this is the words that I want you to remember. How he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. You know, so many times uh, when we hear it's more blessed to give, we automatically think of money. And giving is so much more than some personal item. God doesn't need our money. He doesn't need that personal item that may be so special to us that we cannot let it go. God doesn't need it. If He wants it, it's His. But He says here, He says, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. You might say, why do you start off that way when we're talking about worship? Let me ask you this. What is worship? You know, the analogy that came to me, probably not a very good one, um, this morning in the early service, um, you, you young ladies, I see a lot of beautiful ladies in here today. You remember that time um, when some boy, somewhere between the age of five and 25, because, you know, boys are just different at different ages. But the first time that boy finally figured out that you were a girl and that there was something different. And you said, you messed up and you did something. In your mind, you were just polite. You said, hello. And to him, at that time, it was over. You love him. There's no doubt in his mind, because that's how us boys, you know, we got a little bitty brain. All right? <laughs> and so at that point, in that very first time it happened, the first girl that talked to me that I remember actually seeing her as a girl, and she talked to me, she must be in love with me. We're going to get married. And then there's this weird stuff that just starts happening. You know, the boys are tripping all over themselves. There's drools coming out of their mouth, and they try to do nice things. It just don't work out at all. It's really awkward. It's all messed up. And the girl is like, what is wrong with you? And girls, you'll, you'll know this has happened when you find yourself, you're just doing your normal thing. You, you're sitting at Starbucks, or you, you're working on homework, or you're doing something, and, and you just get this feeling like somebody's just looking at you. And you look up, and you see this guy going. <laughs> and he doesn't notice for about five seconds that you're now looking back at him. And then he sees and he falls all out of the chair. You know, we would say to some degree that boys start to worship girls. You know what I'm talking about? What do I mean? In every, every ounce of their thought process, everything, uh, there, th nothing can come of clarity but thinking about that first girl that they see as a girl. You know, I use that as a joke, that worship means to give our very best to something. To give our very best to something. And so if we're going to worship God, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And we are to give our very best to Him. Theme verse, as we go through this series, a lot happens in the book of John, and I'm going to turn to John chapter 4, and I'm just going to read a few verses, and, and uh, we're not going to break this piece of Scripture down um, for quite some time. But here Jesus must needs go through Samaria. Samaria is how the Word says. In other words, the Spirit led Him to go somewhere, just know this, to go somewhere that the people normally wouldn't go. But He had a leading, and He went to this place. And he knew he was going to meet a young lady who was not living a good life at all. And we'll get into that at some other time. 
and he starts to have a conversation with her, and she perceives there's something special about this guy, and it scares her, and she's, she's like, Jesus, get away, and she tries to change the subject. And this is what she says in John chapter 4, starting at verse number 20. She tries to change it to worship, and she says, Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship, because in the Old Testament everything was focused on worshiping in the tabernacle, or worshiping in the temple. It was in Jerusalem where worship was going to be. Jesus saith unto her, verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But here's where I want you to pay attention. He says, But the hour has cometh and now is. He says, The hour has cometh and now is where the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Why? It tells us at the end of that verse, For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Let us pray. God, I just come to You now, and God, I don't want any of this to be of me. God, just use me now. May the words of Your Gospel the words of your scripture, as I speak them, God, as you lay them upon my heart, may we receive them. And may they be a living word, God. May they just be open to us. And God, would you touch us? God, I ask for this. Help us, God, to understand you. Help us to come closer to you. As we open this subject of worship, God, May we be free enough to, to allow you to do your work. Would you show us something? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I want to carry you as today is an opening as we look at worship. I want to go all the way to the beginning of the Bible, to the, what I call the first worship service. Now, some theologians might disagree with me. That's okay. I, I have people disagree with me all the time. So, I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 4. So, we have Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, we have creation. God edified, He spoke, He created everything. We have all the creations. And then in Genesis chapter 2, God goes back and He expands in the Word a little bit more on man and woman. And then in Genesis this is chapter 3. We all know what happens in 3. It just starts going down from there. Sin enters into the world. They get kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And before they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, you know, can you imagine what that was like? They got to walk with God every day. Everything they needed. They didn't have to farm. They didn't have to go out and do all of these other kind of things. In the Garden of Eden, it was perfect the way God designed. And they got to commune and talk and walk with God. But anyway, we know what happens in the world, and that's where we are today with all our death and suffering. But we know a Redeemer is coming. That's another message. Then we get to Genesis chapter 4. Outside of the Garden of Eden, we have the first family. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering." Now, I want you to see that this is the first worship we see. That now there's been a time that God is no longer walking with man and woman in the Garden of Eden. Sin has made that separation. But we still see a godly family out of faith called to God who is trying to worship and communicate with God. There's been no instruction that we see in Scripture that there is to be sacrifice, that there is to be blessings uh, or things giving to God. But the very first example we see of the family, we see here's Cain and Abel. And, and Cain is a worker of the ground. He's a farmer. And Abel is, is, is a shepherd. He has his flock. And we see them bring things to God to give to Him. Worship. And what I want you to notice when we, we look at this, just a few things to pick up. It says in the process of time, verse 3, that Cain brought the fruit of the ground. Now you might read that and not see much, but I wanted to tell you what's not there. It just says Cain brought something. Something that he had grown. He brought something. 
But I want you to see something that's a little bit more when it says to Abel. And it says, Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock. You see, what we see in a difference is the very first, the very best. See, I want you to pick up on something as we go through this as it pertains to worship. Our heart and our best needs to be what we bring to God at any time. Because there's two kinds of worship. There's only two kinds of worship. And we'll get into that as we continue on. Notice with me, it says, verse 5, "...but unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect." God had no respect of what Cain brought. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou mad, and why is thy countenance fallen? And he says this in verse 7, If thou doest well, shall not thou, or shall thou not be, what's that word? Accepted. You see, if we bring to God our very best, then it will be accepted worship. And if we don't, what's the opposite of accepted? It's unaccepted. We see as we continue on, he says, If not, don't you know that sin lies at the door? You know, the first actual instructions we see of worship, I want you to turn with me to the book of Exodus. First of all, Exodus chapter 20. And uh, in Exodus chapter 20, we get something kind of special. It's the Ten Commandments, all right? And I'm not going to read them all to you. Well, I'm going to read the first six verses of Exodus chapter 20 because if we set the stage and we understand what's going on here, God has chosen His people. He has encamped them in imprisonment in Egypt where they are growing in number, where they are provided for in every way until He decides, I'm going to take my chosen people, the people of Israel, and they're going to be the ministers to the rest of the world. And so He brings them out of Egypt, we know by Moses, and they're going, through the prom going to the Promised Land. Moses is on Mount Sinai, and all the people are down below, and he talks to God, and he gets this. It says in chapter 20, verse 1, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God. You see, the first thing God says to His people, He says, you shall put nothing else before me. And He even says it in the real direct way. I am a jealous God. I am a jealous God. Jesus says it in a nicer way in the New Testament when asked what is the greatest commandment. He says that we are to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like to love our neighbor as ourselves. They're saying the same thing. God has to be first in our life. I bring that to you to understand that this gets done in chapter 20. Chapter 21, 22, 23, the people are restless. Moses is up talking to God. They get into some idol worship. The very thing, the first commandment that God tells them not to do. He's telling Moses, don't do this. You know the story, or most of you do. And so Moses comes down, but they get all that straight. And then we get to Exodus chapter 25. If you would turn there with me. I'm going to run through several verses. In Exodus chapter 25, we've got the Ten Commandments now, and God starts to put instruction in place. Hey, this is how you can worship and be in the best relationship with me of those. He says in verse 2, Speaking to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. God says, Speaking to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Do you see that? God doesn't want just an offering. God doesn't want just your time. God doesn't want just the talents that you have. He's gifted you in other ways. God doesn't want any of that until God has our heart. And so he says, I want them to bring me an offering, but let them give it to me willingly with his heart and ye shall take my offering. And then he says these things over the next verse. Look at what the offering is. He says, And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass, blue and purple and scarlet. And he goes on to the finest, most expensive things of them. We can really understand where it's talking about the gold and the silver. 
you know, but we don't really care about purple and scarlet and those kind of things because we're so rich we got everything there is. But we still want some more gold and silver. So we can understand that part. What God is saying, these are the things that are the most important value to people. And God says, I want that very best to be given to me, but I only want it. I only want it if they have a heart to give it to me. I want you to think about that and I'll come back to it. He goes on in verse 8, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God gives the first place. He says, May there be a sanctuary. It's a tent. I mean, if you look at what it would be, if you read through these next five or six chapters of how the whole sanctuary is to be put together, the tabernacle, it is literally a tent. But it's a tent by God's design. There's nothing great about it looking at it from the outside, but oh, on the inside, in the Holy of Holies where God Himself said He would dwell with them. So He gives them all this instruction. He tells them in verse 16, uh, and, and you shall put in the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. The ark's going to be in the middle, and the testimony is the Ten Commandments. He says, this is how you're going to be in the best relationship with me in understanding these commandments. And there I will meet with thee, verse 22, and will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. So what I want you to see is the first worship place as we see a tabernacle and the order of how to do it. And the next five or six chapters goes through all kinds of things. All right, it talks about candlesticks and, and it talks about be made this way and that way. God designed it all just the way He wanted it. In fact, at the end of chapter 30, it even talks about that, that they were to take certain herbs and, and spices and put them together. God told them how to make incense for them, a specific incense, and He said that that shall be holy only for God. Nobody else should use it. You see, the very best given to God. There's another theme I want you to see out of this as we move to the New Testament. Here... God has His people who lack faith. And He's moving them, but they lack faith. If they had more faith, they would have made a 42-day trip in 42 days. Instead, most of the generation died off, and 40 years later the next generation received the Promised Land. He's dealing with people of lack of faith, but He brings with them an understanding of the Ten Commandments if they would follow Him in faith. He says, you're getting closer to me. I want you to do something. The very next thing we see is God designing to be worshipped. Let me show you this in the New Testament. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, just going to look at two verses. You've heard me say them in many sermons, many different ways. But what I want you to understand is Romans chapter 1 through chapter 10 is all about an understanding of the doctrine of who Jesus Christ is, of who God is, and how we are saved by grace. Not of the law, not following the Old Testament law, but there's a change now because of what Jesus Christ has done. God loving us so much, He sent Jesus to this world who died for our sins, crucified on the cross, arisen three days later so our sins can be forgiven. And through God's grace, not our merit, through God's grace we shall be saved. Ten chapters. In fact, at the end of chapter 10 is where he says, Call on the name of the Lord and believe in your heart and ye shall be saved. Then in chapter 11 he talks about an understanding. Don't forget Israel, they've got great importance. They're still God's chosen people. They are going to receive God's grace as well for those who call upon the name of the Lord. And then a transition happens. So first there is faith. An understanding of a relationship with God. Then read with me in chapter 12, starting at verse 1 and verse 2. He says this, I beseech you, brethren, beseech means, hey, pay attention. It's important. I beseech you. Hey, guys, you really need to understand what this means, what Paul's saying. He says, brethren, by the mercies of God, that's grace, not because we deserve it, but because of what God has done. By the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Do you see worship? You understand what this is? As soon as we understand how to have a relationship with God, the very next thing He shows us in Scripture is worship Him. The ministry is important. We're going to get to that in a minute. 
But before the ministry, he says, worship. And notice how it says, to worship. He says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Our bodies, ourselves, are to be a sacrifice to God. Holy means set apart as we look at it. And notice that next word. It says it's acceptable to God. You see, that's acceptable worship. When we present ourselves a living sacrifice, holy, separated, and accepted by God. And then it says, which is your reasonable service. I want you to look at that, those last two words. It says reasonable service here. Reasonable means rational, logical, if we look at the original translation. You want to know what the word service gets translated to? It's worship. He says, it is your reasonable worship of me because I just saved you. You see, that's what God is saying. Let me show it to you one more time. So much in Scripture. Turn with me, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, we have the same kind of thing happen in 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm just going to breeze through this, the messages in 2. In 1 Peter chapter 1 he says this in verse 9, you're receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. And he goes on and uh, he, he gives lessons. He talks about the change in verse 13, 14, and 15 of chapter 1 that Christians are supposed to go through when we accept Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. There's a real change that's supposed to take place, right? And then he, he gives us a gospel message starting uh, at, at about verse 18. He says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold for your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He goes back and gives an exact gospel message that it is only through the blood of Jesus Christ that we can be redeemed in God's grace. And then he comes to this point after that understanding of our faith, our basic gospel of Jesus Christ and, and us coming, receiving our salvation. He gets into chapter 2 verse 1. Notice what he does here. He says, Wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile, and all hypocrisies, and envies, and evil speakings. You know what he's saying here? He says, get rid of the junk. All these things that create division, that separate you, not only from your brothers and sisters in Christ, but separate you from God. He says, you know what's right, and you know what's wrong. Yes, there's this battle going on inside of you. That's all in the beginning of Romans as we look at that. But we're to follow that, that the Holy Spirit is leading. Because why? God wants to be worshipped. How? In spirit and in truth. So he says, get rid of the junk. And he says, as newborn babes, verse 2, desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. He says, go to the simplest of mind and be nourished by God's Word, and grow from that. If so, be ye tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as an unto a living stone, it's talking about Jesus, we know He's the cornerstone that everything is built. Coming to you as a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, and really pay attention to verse 5. Ye also, that's us, are lively stones, we're built up in a spiritual house because of God's love for us through what He did through Jesus Christ, through His Holy Spirit guiding our life today. Our very bodies have become the tabernacle of God. Our bodies are the temple of God. You see in Exodus where it was saying, here's where you're going to meet Jesus. He wants to come and dwell with people there. That's us now. All because of what Jesus has done. The veil's been torn. There is no separation of the holy and holies. We are all together now. We can call on God. How? Through the Holy Spirit and because of what He's done through His Son, Jesus Christ. So he says here in worship, verse 5, build up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. We get to offer sacrifice and giving to God to offer up, notice what it says, a spiritual sacrifice. And then look at that next word. Acceptable, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Let me talk uh, about ministry versus worship. We focus really hard here on ministry. You know, the ministry is 
that Ephesians 4, the edifying of the body of Christ, the work of the ministry that's doing the great commission of taking care of our brothers and sisters, of teaching the doctrine, the Word of Jesus Christ, of trying to go out and love our communities in whatever way we can. Now, we're not perfect, but that's the intent. We're, we're, we're on fire for the ministry. But God says clearly in His Scripture, before we get in the ministry, He desires us individually to worship Him. And sometimes we skip over that worship and we think of all the details of the work and the ministry. And God is calling us to say, I want you to worship me in spirit and in truth. I'm requiring that of you. You know, worship is giving our very best to God in whatever way that is. We've been saved, or maybe most of us have. But right after that, the very next thing is a beginning of worship. And you know what worship is not? Worship is not Sunday morning. This is the grand worship. This is like the celebration because worship is supposed to be taking place every day of our lives. In every minute of our lives as we're going, we're supposed to be in worship with God. He's our Savior. He's our Creator. And we think sometimes we come into church and we say, I'm going to give God this hour of worship, but our minds are far from us. Let me tell you other things that sometimes I've, I've been guilty of and I just imagine some of you. Y'all know what song we, we sung as we started today? It was Jesus Saves. How many of you can tell me the meaning of that song right now? You see, we sang some songs. The choir sung a song. What was the song they sung? Just tell me the words of it real quick. There was a central message. God is so good. All right? Let me throw one more out how about the doxology we sing in this church and have been singing for a hundred and ten years in this church, right after communion? Do you know what the message is in the doxology? Some of you are saying yes, and you know what? Some of you are like, mm, he got me. Don't make eye contact, preacher. Don't make eye contact. Here's the thing. We can get in the habit of doing stuff. And you know what? If we're not thinking on those words that are being sung, that that is worship to God. God says, unacceptable worship. If we callously pray because it's the time to pray, if you and your meals at home decide you're going to pray before your food, but you aren't focusing on God the Creator who is sitting in heaven, who is all-powerful in every way, and we don't have that connection and understanding who it is we're praying to, you know what God's saying? Unacceptable. That's what He's saying. God wants us to worship Him in spirit that's led by His Spirit and in truth that aligns with His Word. And guys, music is not the only place to worship. We're, we're so misguided sometimes. I don't care what the music is, whether it is a choir singing, whether it is some contemporary gospel song, whether it is some bluegrass music, and we all have different styles that we like. But if you're worshiping God and the song is about Him, then you get lost in the thought of God. But so many times I know I can be guilty of, I don't like that style of music. I wish they'd just quit. Man, can you hear that? I look for all the negatives. Anybody else with me there? Some of you just pure lying in church. <laughs> So in song, we need to worship God in every way. In prayer, we need to understand we're calling on the Almighty God as we're talking to Him. We need to be humbled in every way as we do that. When there's preaching or teaching going on, we need to be focused in that Word and allow the Spirit to lead you. Don't be thinking about all those other distractions. Worship is you bringing your very best, giving you to God in every way. You know, there's so much in Scripture from the very beginning to the very end. 
about worshiping the Father. If you would show the next slide for me, and I'm going to close here. Here's the ministry. Because the Holy Spirit somewhere in many of your lives came around you, you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That all originated from God. It's not by any man. Man may be used, but God is the one who calls people into His church. So somewhere, God, through what He did with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit now, put someone in front of you that accepted, or you accepted that call of the Holy Spirit. And that's the ministry. We're gifted. Uh, Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Ephesians 4, all talk about the spiritual gifting of the ministry. It's made for the unification of the body of Christ, the edification of the saints in the work of the ministry. That's the gifting of God. It comes from God through Jesus, through His Spirit, to His people for us to do the ministry. It's got significant importance. But that is not worship. You see, all that is is coming down. Worship is us going up. And to do all of that effectively, we got to keep going up with it. You know, sometimes we, we get the disadvantage. Hang on one second, Shannon. Sometimes we get in our mindsets, well, if I just, if I just read the Word, if I know all the doctrine, then, then that's it. That's going to be it. We just rely on truth. God says, worship me in spirit and in truth. Other times there's people that say, I just want to worship God in spirit, and they don't care about the truth. Mm -mm, unacceptable. God says, be led by the Spirit, compared in the truth of His Word, and that is how we are to worship Him. Last slide I'd like to show, my art's not that great, all right? I'm telling you, the guy's got a little, little bitty brain. This is a daily cycle of what should be happening in our worship. Because of what God did through Jesus Christ, His Holy Spirit to us, we've been saved. And because of that, through His Spirit, because of what He did through Jesus Christ, we're worshiping the Father. And that cycle should just be continuing all day long. All right? When you go into the world tomorrow, and some of you have, you have difficult situations that you know you're going to go in, stop thinking about how bad the situation is and start thinking about the goodness of God and praise Him for it and expect that He will get you through the very thing you need to go through. Did you listen to the song? God is always good. And even in the toughest times, God will carry you through there if your eyes are on Him. Stop looking at the negatives. We spend so much time looking at what's not right, and we need to look to a wonderful God that's perfect in every way. And as we do that in every second of our life, God is always good. This is just the beginning of uh, what I hope God does a miraculous thing in the body of each believers at this church. As we explore worship according to God's Word, I'm going to close with a simple prayer. It's going to be a little bit different. I'm not going to ask Kathy or DJ to come play. I'm just going to pray and ask for one thing. Before I do that, understand that myself, elders, uh, deacons and deaconesses will be available after church for anyone who wants to pray or who may have something on your mind. We'll stay as long as you need that. I'm not going to do an altar call today, but if the Lord speaks to you, I want you to come up after service. My prayer is just this, and I want you to pray with me, that God will forgive me, and if that's your individual request, that's up to you, of anything that has been unpure to Him in worship. And that right now, where we are, that God would help me, and I want that prayer to be for you, that God would help you understand exactly what He seeks. It's not, it's not some, some uh, you know, it's, it's not some pressure that God's putting on us. No, He wants us to be full of joy by doing what He's called us to do, and it starts in worshiping Him. We've received His salvation. We should thank Him daily for it. That's going to be the prayer. Only you know how God is speaking to you. Would you stand as we close? God, you truly are always good, so good. Even in the darkest hour, even in the, the, the biggest mess we can put ourselves in. God, for the messes that we didn't create, but somehow we found ourselves in. To the joys on top of a mountain, God, you are good. 
And God, I just thank you for this group of believers in every way. I, I know many of their hearts are true to seek and want to worship you in every way. And God, we, we also fall short individually. Forgive us individually, God, for us bringing anything to you that was not complete from our heart. For all those unacceptable gifts, God, forgive us. It's a wonderful thing your scripture tells us that our sins are removed as far as the east is from the west when we call upon you. Now, God, in this freeness that we are in now, God, I just ask you to help us. God, you tell us when your people come together as one and pray that you hear. Number two, God, that you do something. And God, I just, I don't want to limit you. I don't want to tell you what to do, God. You're God. Would you do something that helps each one of us individually get a little closer to you, to desire to seek more of you in your word and through prayer and in your spirit? And God, would you allow chains to fall off? Would you allow something to happen? Would you allow people who are asleep to wake up. God, we praise you for being such a wonderful God. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. It is in His name we pray. Amen.